Welcome everyone. My name is Brooke Sherman and I am the program coordinator for the Wilson Center's Middle East program. We are pleased to host you for this year's annual Halle Esfandieri Forum, the first to be celebrated in person since the COVID-19 pandemic, for a discussion on women leaders in the advancement of human rights and gender equality in Iran and globally. To introduce leading women rights advocate Mahnaz Afghami and today's moderator, please welcome Ambassador Mark Green, Director, President, and CEO of the Wilson Center. Thank you, Brooke, and thanks for the great work that you're doing. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Wilson Center, where we are congressionally chartered, scholarship-driven, fiercely nonpartisan, and fiercely independent. Today, we are proud to host the in-person 2023 Hale Esfandiari Forum. Now, uh, Hale is known around the world for her important writings on Iran, but she holds a very special place here at the Wilson Center. We too like her writings on Iran, <laughs> but she is also the founding director of our Middle East program. And she led the team from 1998 through 2015. Under her leadership, the program began and continues to promote women's empowerment and rights around the world, especially in the MENA region. This series honors her commitment to these causes. It was inaugurated in 2017 by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, a scholar and alumni here of the Wilson Center. Since then, the forum has featured Senator Chris Van Hollen, Dr. Rola Dashti, Under Secretary General of the UN, and Ambassador Milan Verveer, Executive Director of Georgetown's Women, Peace, and Security Program. Today, we are most proud to add Matnaz of Kami to that distinguished list of speakers. Uh, while this last year will be remembered for many things, clearly the images of courage and leadership in Iran will dominate our thinking for a long time. When I think of this last year, my mind will always be drawn back to the truly remarkable leadership and courage of so many young women across Iran. Uh, what we have seen from women's leadership in Iran has been nothing short of extraordinary. They have bravely called for change, persevering in what can only be described as a brutal response from the regime. Mahnaz has walked the walk. Uh, today's inspiring speaker will share from her memories, her experience, her, her thoughts on the integral role that women can play in leadership, in community organizing, in mobilizing others and advancing human rights and freedoms. Her journey in activism started more than four decades ago in Iran, but has taken her to many places and brought her to many audiences. Prior to the 1979 Iranian Revolution, she played a clear, or an important role, a key role, in the passage of the progressive 1975 Family Protection Law and served as Iran's Minister for Women's Affairs. She founded the Association of Iranian University Women and served as Secretary General of the Women's Organization of Iran. Today, she leads the Women's Learning Partnership as its founder and president. It's an organization dedicated to advocating for women's rights and promoting civic engagement, human rights, and women's leadership. We are so grateful uh, for your time with us today, and we are even more grateful for all that you have done over the many years. You truly are an inspiration and a most worthy speaker for our forum this year. So welcome again. And without any further ado, Marissa, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Green, for your very kind um, introduction. Uh, Mahnaz, welcome once again to the uh, Wilson Center, and thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, I want to mention that Pala Isfandiari is here with us today. Um, as Ambassador Green mentioned, she's the founder of MEP, but I think to, um, for all of us at MEP, she's a mentor, so thank you so much for your guidance and direction. Um, I also want to welcome our online audience. We had, I think, um, over 270 RSVPs. So to all of you watching online, if you want to submit your questions, make sure you do that either um, in the comments box or via Twitter. Um, 
uh, and the handle is at Wilson Center MEP. Mahnaz, um, I want to start the conversation this morning with the now, um, focusing on the current developments in Iran. Um, as Ambassador Green mentioned, um, protests broke out um, in September after um, Masa Amini uh, died in police custody. Um, her crime, according to those who have arrested her, uh, was basically not adhering to the dress code. And um, many would say that she didn't just die in police custody. Many would say she was killed. And uh, we've seen um, so many uh, thousands of men and women, uh, but particularly led by young women, um, uh, basically protest nonstop. Things have fizzled out a little bit because, as um, Ambassador Green mentioned also earlier, the regime turned to what it knows best, tactics of repression, arrests, um, over tens of thousands of um, prisoners who are currently in the Avin prison, which is the same prison that um, Hale was, was, uh, was taken in in solitary confinement in 2006, uh, but then also executions and death sentences. So um, I guess, you know, for you, um, uh, given your experience and the way that you've led the women's movement in Iran, you were, after all, the first Woman, um, uh, Minister of Women's Affairs in Iran, and the first to, to hold such a position, I think, in the Muslim world. Um, how do you see the situation currently, and how did this movement come about? Uh, thank you for that question, Marissa. <clears throat> uh, I just want to first say that I'm so happy to be here after a long time and uh, at a, uh, an event that honors Hale. Uh, Hale was uh, deputy for international affairs um, in Iran at the Women's Organization and a multilingual, very uh, good as you all know at writing and so forth. But, but I never forget that um, one time uh, when Molly Haskell and some group of uh, artists and filmmakers had come to Iran for the International Women's Year, uh, they specifically referred to her and to a couple of others as the people at the Women's Organization of Iran, the Iranians, are uh, very familiar with how to push the levers of power, <laughs> uh, but uh, they also read Sylvia Plath and <laughs> things that, that you don't expect. And so on and on with other comments, very impressed. And uh, as we see, uh, she has been impressing people across the world ever since. So I'm very glad to, uh, to be here at this particular moment. And, uh, and thank you for the question. I think that um, it's very important. And unfortunately, uh, Iranian history of the 70s uh, has been much uh, uh, altered and or even ignored, especially what has to do with women. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very important to see these young women uh, being so dedicated, so aware, and so sophisticated mm -hmm. in how they deal with, uh, with the issues of uh, the first ever uh, revolution that has been initiated by women in the world. And it's not only a matter of initiating the revolution, it's how they handle it. Along with men, they've been able to bring the men along. And not only that, the way that they deal with the slogans, with the uh, needs that they uh, express, uh, because it's something that no one can say, take uh, any kind of a problem or, or uh, have uh, differences of opinion. You're talking about life and liberty and women, you know. So it's a highly sophisticated mm -hmm. movement. How that came about was not accidental. Mm -hmm. People don't actually grow and blossom because they're being harassed and limited and told what to wear and what to eat and who to sit next to. It, the, other, the thing that uh, inspires uh, people is a level of consciousness raising and mobilization in a, in a 
population. Once that happens, once people begin to be aware of the rights that they need and want, um, and it's not easy to take it away from them, no matter what goes on around them. And I think that that mobilization started in Iran a hundred years before this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has stayed with people. They have experiences that are uh, cultural parts of their being, and, and they are showing it now. And of course, uh, I have to say a little bit about what the organization was like uh, and how it uh, evolved. Uh, as uh, everyone knows, uh, the, the earlier parts of the, uh, the consciousness raising happened uh, decades uh, before I was uh, working in Iran, uh, and we all benefited by that work. But what we did uh, in Iran was uh, uh, sort of, a, I, I have to say, an accident of fate, because when I went to Iran to start working at the women's organization, I knew nothing about either the history of the country or uh, how it works. I, I knew nothing about the women's organization, because I really had studied English literature in America and loved it and uh, was very happy doing it. And, uh, and uh, it was almost accidental that I became the uh, Minister of Women. I mean, not Minister of Women. First was the idea of the women's organization. Uh, uh, I, uh, I don't want to go through uh, the details of how that happened. Uh, I think you have to read the book to, <laughs> <laughs> to find out about that. Uh, but uh, not knowing really what one was supposed to do with the women's organization, uh, what we did was we decided to go around. After all, it's a national women's organization. So we thought we'd go around and find out uh, what people wanted to uh, factories, to farms, to uh, schools, even prisons. And what people kept saying regularly was that, uh, for instance, let me just give you an example. When uh, we went to a textile factory, for instance, I kept asking the people thinking that laws were the ones that they wanted changed. So I kept thinking that they want uh, the right to divorce, for instance. Mm -hmm. Asking women, would they, is that important to them? The woman ignored and went on to say, I need to be able to support myself. What's the use of having the right to divorce if I have to end up in my husband uh, in my father's house instead of my husband's? Repetition of that over and over again made us understand that economic empowerment, mm -hmm. which basically involves skills building and support from the society, is what people need, women need. And that's what became our goal. Education, training for skills building, and then a series of laws that supported a woman working, and a woman working with responsibility. So that's what we were able to do. And everything that we did focused, again, on feedback mm -hmm. from the people. And so in a short period of time, really very short, with the help of people who were involved in the organization, we came into building a hundred, over a hundred centers that were focused on literacy, on awareness raising, on skills building for particular skills that women can have in order to be able to uh, make a living, and then child care on, on the premises so that they could leave their children and, and be able to learn and to do the work. And uh, also later, uh, a little bit later, when we were capable of having the dialogue that we wanted at a higher level of government, the idea of, of uh, seven months, up to seven months pregnancy leave, mm -hmm. maternity leave, having uh, half-time 
uh, work for full-time benefits for working women, and support of this sort, which m allow, made people aware and, pos uh, and, and uh, capable of doing the work that they wanted to. So just to make this, um, uh, to wrap it up, in a matter of a few years, really less than a decade, basically, there were one million people who came to the centers, to the hundred centers mm -hmm. that uh, the organization had around the country. And there were 350 branches around the country. They elected the people who were their secretaries, so to speak, the, the directors. They came once a year and approved of, of the plan of action. And the board, I must say this, because I've had a lot of experience with boards and having been on many of them and also having uh, had them uh, at my organizations, usually it's a matter of uh, meeting once or twice a year. These people who were very responsible people, some of them had high level uh, leadership positions, they would come every Saturday, which is a working day in Iran, and would stay from lunch all the way to the evening mm -hmm. discussing and deciding what the organization would do. I, I uh, hope that I don't bore you with a, uh, a, plan, a review of what we did, but unless you see what happened in terms of change in the country in a short period of time, and realize that that's because once people get uh, allowed and opened, uh, have the uh, space for opened up for them to participate, sky's the limit what they can uh, ar arrange. And uh, that's what had happened. And uh, so there was that level of, of, mm -hmm. of serious involvement. And so uh, the women that we see now mm. are the grandkids of, of yeah. those women. And they have that to look back on uh, always. Mm. And that's what they have never let go. And that's very um, hopeful and very encouraging because the Islamic Revolution, um, I mean, they, they came in destroying the, com the accomplishments of the women's movement. The first thing that um, Khomeini did was negate the family law that you worked on, the 1975 family law. Um, and like you said, uh, generations later, um, the young women, even though they live in a repressive, oppressive society, um, they are tactful. Um, they, they have been using, as you said, very sophisticated tools. Um, and they seem to understand how to use, you know, online um, social media tools that have kept, uh, uh, you know, these images and footage um, in our, you know, in our homes and on our phones um, to keep uh, to keep the momentum. Um, so how can this be sustained in the face of more and more repressive measures? Because, you know, it, it's it's um, many of these women are perhaps not organized. Um, we, we haven't seen one leader emerge, um, but how can this be sustained? And, and do you believe that eventually regime change that everyone is calling for is only something that could happen from within? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm perpetually very positive and hopeful. So sometimes it looks as if it's sort of a little bit uh, unreal, but I deeply believe that this first revolution by women in the history of the globe, you know, is just as positive as what the Iranians did in 1979, which bring into being the first theocracy. I have, I see scholars here who can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've looked and looked. There is no theocracy in the sense of a government run by mullahs. Mm -hmm. We have governments that uh, have the king or queen Elizabeth or queen uh, the king of Morocco as the uh, head of the church or the mosque, but we, uh, we have the, uh, 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 the pope in, in uh, Rome, but the pope doesn't run Italy. You know, this is the thing. Theocracy is when mullahs become 
uh, ministers of uh, agriculture or when they become in charge of uh, you know nuclear uh, development or whatever uh, so this was the first thing we did as Iranians we don't do it halfway you know <laughs> we don't go crazy you know that, that way and then what we did was really impacted the entire entire region and the entire world you know mm -hmm. This emphasis on radical uh, religion uh, was an outcome of that. And then, look, you, you had a, uh, uh, um, uh, the Middle East, you know, had really uh, significant leaders, you know, from Bhutto to Zahir Shah to all sorts of people. And even the uh, bad ones, let's, like Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, well, they had nothing like this, you know. I mean, it was a country, it was running, it was dictatorial, but it wasn't like this. Mm. Uh, so uh, we did that, you know, <laughs> and uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but then now we built the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. and, and I personally think that what is happening there is going to be the forerunner of a global movement mm. uh, that will change uh, the gender relations in a positive way because it's not taking a sort of a uh, controversial or, or, or counter men kind of a thing. It's not, uh, it's working with men. They've tried very hard to have men involved and the men are involved. So uh, this is the kind of thing that has the possibility. And for someone like me who's worked all of my life in international, global uh, uh, women's work, I see the possibility when I see our partners all over the world standing up and, and just speaking in their own language, uh, supporting this movement, uh, it's going to have a global impact. And, you know, everywhere from the, you know, grassroots workers in, all, in Global South to the Parliament of France to... Uh, everywhere, at, from the lowest to the highest levels of engagement, people are supporting the movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that this has the possibility of becoming a global women's movement, which already it has begun to be, and a good prototype for what can happen in the future. And we certainly need it right now. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you've mentioned that there is support globally. In the MENA region in particular, there were protests, uh, even in neighboring Afghanistan, that um, is unfortunately back in the hands of the Taliban. And of course, the first things that they do is cut the line, uh, you know, um, uh, all the all the lines, you know, separate gender, um, uh, both, both genders completely, um, and prevent women from being active participants um, equally in the public sphere, um, but they still protested. Um, so how how can um, how can the you know what's happening in Iran um, maybe inspire others to also support women in Afghanistan? Uh, you know you've you are part of both worlds here in the United States and Iran because you lived in both countries and you you studied here, but you also worked in Iran. Um, what role can the United States play to support women um, and young girls? Because it's also about the um, next generation. Uh, I think that, the, of course, the government has its own uh, uh, ways of helping and, and supporting. Well, one of them is by limiting uh, support f that would help the government but would help the people. That is, we don't want sanctions, let's say, that would harm the people. Mm -hmm. But uh, sanctions that would limit the power of the mullahs, of course, is a very good thing. But I don't think that a place like the United States especially can be too visible uh, in terms of its support mm -hmm. because the uh, Islamic Republic would immediately say that this is a Western and American uh, attempt to uh, fight Islam, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, support for from the people, from the organizations, from mm, uh, people who represent 
people, such as Congress. Uh, these are very, uh, very substantial and important. And I think that women, support of women themselves around the world, because you see, this is one of our problems that we have uh, taken uh, either percentages. I remember, for instance, when we were in Beijing for the Fourth World Conference for Women, uh, we were talking, okay, now we're going from 20% involvement of women in leadership to 50% involvement. We have to snap out of that, you know. We don't want percentages of uh, involvement. What we want is to work with men to rethink the whole way that we relate to each other because we as women are also uh, people who have received the, the cultural impact of patriarchy. We are the ones who are half of the population and, and actually train the other half. So we are the ones who tell the girls you have to cross your legs and wear pink and speak quietly. We are the ones who tell the boys that uh, boys don't cry, you know, so mm -hmm. they don't have uh, emotional uh, relationship. We, uh, we are all having to work with with changing the culture of patriarchy, top-down decision-making, and aggression and ambition. Not some of the ambition is very good, and men have had that, and it's wonderful that they have done so much that is uh, that we all are working with. But at the same time, you know, the, it's, it's really killing us. It's, it, the earth is basically... Uh, falling apart, you know. Pandemics are, are uh, wild all over the world. Uh, uh, the human, the uh, climate justice uh, is n non-existent. Refugees, a pro product of all of these things, mm -hmm. are are there, you know. So the interconnectedness of our problems, and the the terrific uh, uh, urgency that we have when even democracies are falling apart, even in countries such as the United States. So what we have to do, the women have to quit about 20% uh, of this, 10% of that, and uh, uh, what have you done to us kind of thing. We have to work together to create a new way of uh, dealing with, with uh, life and with the issues of life and, and to create a whole new structure. Uh, of human relationships. And to do that, I think the awareness that is coming through the Iranian uh, movement and the, the global connection that is happening, it's very hopeful. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, breaking out of these like, silos of, uh, the, you know, for instance, Marxism, the capitalism, uh, all the religious and uh, other types mm -hmm. of uh, limitations, and I think that we are uh, actually involved. We, in fact, it's never been like this. It's new. I just hope that we realize it the way we didn't realize what was going to happen when the theocracy would come. We didn't have any idea this is what would happen. Now we have to realize that this can be the other side, and we really have to help it. You know, and if we realize it, and and are aware of it, I think we can really make a difference. Um, you pointed to the inclusive nature of how women have been um, working with men in Iran, you know, mm -hmm. mobilizing and organizing, um, and that this should be the next approach. Um, I think many of our audience members, myself included, I've worked on so many different development projects in the MENA region. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these, you know, women empowerment projects are focused only on women. Men are not part of that conversation. Um, you know, yes, they need skills building and capacity building, um, and there are many different um, components to that, and that's very important. Uh, but, but men are not part of that formula. So um, and in the work that you do as um, president and CEO of uh, Women's Learning Partnership, um, how can you integrate more of this, you know, uh, I guess, redefining masculinity approach to this formula of um, uh, gender parity, um, achieving gender parity in a in a different way. Because whatever was, you know, wh whatever de the development community is doing so far, it's there's progress, but it's not enough. It's not where we need to be. That's true. Yeah, well, uh, the the whole. Uh, 
the whole uh, way that uh, we work at the uh, Women's Learning Partnership uh, is uh, learning from each other mm -hmm. and being open and flexible. You know, we don't have a, sort of a theory and then try to implement that theory. We learn and we change and we evolve. And uh, now uh, all across, um, we're working with men whenever possible, as much as possible. But the whole idea is that even if we change ourselves, the way we raise kids, the way we relate to each other, the way we sometimes don't take responsibility for our whole society, we just think the peace that has to do with us. And, uh, and also, if we snap out of something that has come largely from the uh, radical right as well as the radical left, uh, yeah. to give up the idea that thinking of ourselves as sexual and reproductive entities. We have sexual and reproductive functions that are very important, but we have a hell of a lot, sorry, uh, we are a lot more than that. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we have brains, we have ideas, we're intelligent, we have thoughts, we, we have a way of relating to each other that unfortunately men don't have. You know, I, they don't talk to each other, they don't share their feelings, they don't give personal support to each other. We have all of that to bring to the, to the table, as well as our new ways of looking at relationships. So I think that, uh, that if, if we, uh, you know, reach out to men, uh, let's see, for instance, with this movement that we're talking about in Iran, it started way at the beginning. As soon as the revolution happened, Mr. Khomeini came in uh, mid-February, -fe uh, mm -hmm. and immediately he canceled the family law and he told the women they had to be veiled, which is symbolic. It really doesn't, one way or the other, it doesn't make that much difference. Uh, the ex imposing of it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Two weeks later, on March 8th, women were the first to realize, oh my God, what have we done? And they came out in large numbers and demonstrated. It took men a whole long time later to realize what a mistake it had. Mm -hmm. And all the time they have been trying to, to uh, express that. The one million signatures, for instance, was when there wasn't as much social networking and connection as later. And they, we worked with the people inside. We, we brought about 10 of them outside, and they learned uh, how to do this leadership building that is the opposite of top-down uh, patriarchal leading. And uh, we also uh, shared the concept that the needs of human beings are shared across all cultures, all other d diversities. If you, if you talk to people at any level, anywhere, what they want. And sometimes for women, it's better to say what you want for your children rather than what you want for yourself because they're not going to say what they want for themselves so much. And the whole list that they give you is the Declaration of Human Rights. Everybody wants exactly the same things. There's nobody who says, I don't want to have money or I don't want to be able to support myself or I want don't want to not have uh, to get my husband's permission to leave my ha house or whatever. So all want the same things. But the way that they achieve that mm -hmm. has to be contextual, culturally, linguistically, traditionally. And so that's what we do. We work in 28 languages. Remember, the United Nations has five. And that helps. And it's not us, tw 20 people in the Washington. It's all over the world. People are doing it. You know, mm -hmm. we couldn't. I don't even know when the, whether uh, uh, the curriculum is upside down or right side up because there's so many languages, so many uh, ways they are written. So uh, that's the thing that that we need to do. We need to uh, get out of our uh, sort of silo that can't fit more than half of the population, you know. We don't, we, we include everything, all races, all religions, all uh, uh, political trends and whatever. So we should come out of that and try to focus on how to change beyond equality, you know. And, and uh, once we do that, nothing can stop us, you know. I mean, 
I don't know. I mean, I know I probably sound a little bit off, but but that is the way I see it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very grateful for your optimism because when you look at the data in the MENA region, um, it's not very encouraging. Um, and I, th I think the approach that you identified in terms of working with local organizations is um, more helpful than sort of more, you know, Im imposed programs from abroad. Um, uh, but um, given that you work with so many different um, countries, what are some of the common challenges that, um, that you see across the board? Um, because unfortunately in the MENA region, I mean, fortunately, let me start with the positive. Um, in, in, when it comes to education, uh, gender parity has been achieved in almost most of the countries. Um, but then this is not translating to economic participation. And there are lots of reasons. But I wonder if you're seeing the same challenges in other parts of the world as well. Well, the MENA region, unfortunately, mostly because of this uh, you know, uh, Islamic radicalism uh, and political Islam, it has suffered a lot mm -hmm. and the wars that have followed that. I mean, they are de decimated, you know, but, but uh, nevertheless, what you point out is very important. One of us, our greatest uh, goals has been to, to bring uh, specialization and bring higher education as well as literacy to, to, to women across the world. That's one uh, piece of it. But uh, you see, the, the idea is to, to believe in ourselves and believe in working with men and being a holistic kind of a movement. And I think that if that is internalized, then, then uh, nothing can, can really basically stop us. And, uh, and I think that men are getting more and more ready to do that if we give them a chance. And also, one of the issues that we need to do is, is uh, uh, to have dialogue at, across different fields. For instance, one of the things that we are doing now is uh, trying to uh, start a whole uh, new project having to do with opening closed societies, because obviously, the way the world is going with social networking and, and uh, the uh, ex uh, expansion of that, uh, people just pick up whatever is going on somewhere else, and st especially young people, and try to uh, bring that, uh, you know, all over the uh, society. And it doesn't always work, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be careful about what we pass on and how we pass it on, the information. And some of the ideas that come out of the West, unfortunately, and out of the United States especially, is that there are too many small silos and too limited a group who support those silos. Since women contain all of those, mm. we contain the disabled, we can contain all races and uh, and uh, religions and everything else. We have to have a more holistic uh, uh, goal for ourselves. And I think if, if we focus on it, you know, the, the, what I mentioned, the one million signatures, for instance, uh, was a good uh, model because it was the first one that brought door to door, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, information sharing and inclusion. And that was a beginning, and not the beginning, but the beginning of a large uh, 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 demonstrations and, and uh, mobilization. And then, of course, the Green Movement was a mm -hmm. huge one that, that made it political, you know. And that's what, for instance, the new women's uh, movement came out of. And, and uh, I think that this can happen elsewhere as well. And... and uh, uh, that's, uh, I mean, I think it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. It's it's an existential situation that uh, requires our being there and snapping out of our our uh, s focus on reproductive uh, rights and and the problems. I remember that. Can I just tell a little anecdote? Yes, of course. Please go ahead. <laughs> when when we were visiting and and Holler uh, was part of it in China and in the Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union we had a uh, we had a, a translator, uh, and uh, when we were seeing one of the um, the, the uh, governors, uh, who was a woman, 
uh, she was translating. She, uh, the gov the um, uh, governor was talking about reproductive rights, and the translator couldn't think of the word uh, reproductive rights. So she turned around and said, uh, the governor is talking about this here domestic economy. <laughs> 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 because apparently they were always talking about domestic economy and this here domestic economy. We have to snap out of this here domestic economy and, and, and just <laughs> be a little bit more open and, and, and realize our own power and our own numbers and our own capability and what we have to bring to the table. It's up to us, you know, as our documentary by the same name says. Thank you. So before I turn to the audience for questions, um, I, I first I want to um, make sure that everyone knows that um, your new book, The Other Side of Silence, a, a memoir of exile, Iran and the global women's movement, um, is uh, set up there. Um, if you um, want to purchase a copy and you'll be signing um, copies after this. Um, I just want to uh, point to one of the anecdotes that you mentioned in the book where um, you were the first woman min minister, and it was a cabinet of, I think, 20 ministers, and it was just you, the only woman amongst 20 men. Um, and there were some interesting, you know, funny anecdotes about, you know, it's not, not so much how awkward you felt, but how everybody else felt. Um, take us back to that moment, and, and I guess um, if we can link it to the now of how, you know, with everything happening, how did that moment sort of inspire the work that you're doing? Uh, well, uh, one of the things that I learned uh, actually uh, working in the government, and remember at the time that I went into the government, it was an unpopular government internationally, mm. and, and uh, also the feminists were very much against being in the government, and um, which I thought I wasn't sure uh, whether it was good or not, but I realized that being having access to power is very important if you want to have your goals uh, met. And uh, the people who were there in the uh, cabinet were all younger people who had studied abroad and uh, uh, had gotten high degrees, PhDs mostly, in the field in which they were working, unlike what is believed about Iran. That's how it was. Uh, these were very well-educated young people, not because they were s connected to somebody, but because they had the, uh, the expertise. But of course, they were guys, they were men, and they were men in a country that, this is 50 years ago, and uh, there wasn't that much uh, consciousness, uh, you know, uh, even now, for instance, when I speak with some of my academic friends especially, uh, I see this, uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen that uh, book that's called uh, Men Explain Things to Me. Have you seen that? <laughs> that? That really is very interesting. They're always in explaining things to us. Uh, and of course, the women and the men in the cabinet had every right to explain things to me because I hadn't been in the cabinet and I didn't. And, you know, I was the second woman in the world to have that position. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't, and nobody knew what it was supposed to be. What's a minister of women? Which, again, another accident. Honestly, God, if we could use the accidents that happen in our lives to the best possibility, sometimes we really get great responses and, and so forth. So we said, okay, uh, we don't know what a woman's uh, uh, minister should do either. So we kept asking for things uh, which we said it's a good thing, but they said, okay. Like, for instance, we said every time that uh, something comes to, uh, to the uh, cabinet uh, for, for approval, when a suggestion is made, a proposal is made, that should come to the women's minister because we have to see how it deals with women. They said, <laughs> maybe that's what it should do <laughs> because, uh, you know, so they did it. Or then when we said, um, when we wrote the, um, uh, the uh, plan of action, the, we, we did the draft plan of action for the Mexico conference, for the United Nations uh, conference, and uh, what was in the draft was that all issues are women's issues, which later became a slogan. But at that time, uh, we just thought, what should a woman's minister do? Well, okay, agriculture, uh, welfare, education, planning, 
definitely justice. All of that relates to women. So what we have to do is to get the ministers who are in charge of these uh, ministries to have a meeting with the Minister of Women once a year with the Prime Minister as the uh, uh, head, and then every month the senior deputy should meet with the minister. And so that was miraculous, and I wish it would happen in other countries. It was because they didn't know what it could, what, what wasn't part of the whole thing. Uh, so uh, they agreed with it, and we created this. We created a meeting of 10 ministers once a year to look to see how the development projects worked with regards to women. And that is an amazing thing, you know. Uh, how is the budget spent? How much is impacting women and so forth? And every month with the uh, deputies. So this was really a huge achievement and, and it was really very helpful. So uh, the ministers didn't, um, th they were very civilized, very nice, very collaborative, but as time went on, can I say one other little thing? It's in the book, actually. Uh, it, when we went, one of the times when we went on a, on a trip uh, to uh, the um, uh, uh, to see agri agricultural uh, uh, projects, uh, we were standing with the ministers who had come there, and there were the locals who were also around after we had spoken to, to the people that we had come to speak to, to. And then what happened was that uh, one of the ministers turned around and told the Minister of Agriculture that your zipper is open. And uh, he looked around the locals and he turned around to me and the other two ministers and zipped up his zipper. I mean, this might sound to you like something ridiculous, but to me it was a triumph because it seemed that not only our own, this here domestic economy is not important, their domestic economy is not important either. You know, that, that let's snap out of this. Let's get the work done. And, and, and so I was, a, 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 you know, a supporter. I was one of his peers. So he turned to me instead of the local guys, you know, and that, I mean, I don't know, it may not mean anything, but... but oh, uh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ab absolutely. Thank you for, for sharing the story. Uh, so let's turn to the audience for uh, questions. Uh, David, just wait for the mic. Uh, Dave Ottaway. I'm here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I wonder if you could help me with something. Um, I'm very curious about what has been accomplished by the current uprising of women in Iran? Because I'm reading reports uh, that suggest not much. On the other hand, the morality police is supposedly no longer enforcing the dress code, but maybe the police are. But then I was listening to NPR yesterday. Somebody in Tehran said, no, women can now walk around without uh, uh, the veil, et cetera. What, what, What's been accomplished in your mind so far by the uprising? Uh, I, thank you. Um, I, I think that um, uh, the idea of uh, uh, the uh, guards uh, or others uh, imposing the veil is a side issue. It's a symbolic issue, symbolic of, of all the limitations on life and liberty and women. And so, um, in that sense, yes, they're not listening. They're they're walking around, and and uh, the government is afraid to become too uh, hostile, too much. Uh, and they don't want any any presentation of um, cruelty to come outside and make life more difficult for them. But it's not in that sense that uh, how much, which I, it has changed. It, the, the people walk around, you know, uh, as much as they can, uh, and, and uh, they, they sometimes are in trouble, and sometimes nobody is around to do anything. But that's symbolic. What is happening is that the population has had enough. There was so many years after the revolution where we had two types of people in Iran to work with, because we always, my organization always worked with Iran. 
you know, undercover a lot, but, but always did. And uh, we had two groups, one that thought that the uh, government could be reformed and one that thought that it's impossible, you can't if, in, uh, reform. Now they have been able, the ones who thought that it's impossible have grown to the entire population, not the entire population, I don't want to be exaggerating, but to a large part of the population. That is, the Islamic Republic has lost credibility and followers across the population. So it's a matter of time and circumstance when it will fall. And of course the problem is, how are we going to deal with it? But of course, the, I remember uh, Shirin Abadi in the recent um, uh, meeting that uh, the, was televised, uh, she, they asked her, uh, you know, uh, what is going to happen after they fall? And she said, well, have you just thought about what is going to happen if they don't fall. So that's an important thing because the continuation of this government is not only bad for Iran itself, it's devastating for Iran, but it's devastating for the whole world, the way it's, the government is interconnecting with other uh, countries and, and in other uh, violent situations and so forth. So uh, I think that uh, it has is, it is really been very effective all in all. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Nilo. First of all, thank you so much. This is very uh, enlightening. Right here, right here. Oh, thank you. So uh, I would love to learn more about your view on the double standards that goes back uh, rooted in our culture um, and what we see today. Um, as an Iranian woman, um, yes, uh, me too. I was brought up, uh, you know, with a culture of, you know, act like a lady, don't speak loud, don't speak back, don't do this, don't laugh loud, you know, uh, but yet be resilient, yet, you know, um, be a fighter, yeah, be it strong. Um, and I brought up in a family of three girls, and uh, I remember when my first personal life fell apart, I looked at my father and I said, you never taught me to be a woman, a wife. You taught me to be a businesswoman, but you never taught me to be a good wife. And I blamed myself. Uh, taking this back to a current situation, it is a unity against the government but what are, what, your, what are your thoughts on what we're going to do about the culture, about the culture that in South, for example, a brother has a right to kill a sister who thinks that it's not, you know, uh, basically fateful um, or has done something that is against the uh, pride of the family or the father. And um, in many, many parts of education is, is a huge part, you know, uh, that yes, we want to be free, we want to work, we are the bread and butter bringer, we are the mothers, we are the sisters, we are the daughters, but yet in Iran particularly and in that region, uh, we have learned to not to speak back, to be always, you know, the, 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 the suppression comes from inside the many families, you know, how do you think that would change? Mahnaz, may I we take another question? Yes, please. And then um, Lynn, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, great question, because I also speak to a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm Lebanese, so I'm born and raised in Lebanon, and a lot of girls who are who have dual nationalities, like born in Canada or in Lebanon or in the States, from the region, always feel that, what do I do? Should I become American or should I keep? And they feel like this. there is a, always a conflict. What I want to ask is, how do, what do you think we can learn from the revolution, the women revolution in Iran, and how can we help them? How can we keep the momentum going? And should we wait for the women in the rest of the MENA region to be angry and to voice out their frustration of the government, of the oppression that they're facing? Thank you. Please go ahead. 
Uh, well, um, <clears throat> the two questions are all both very good, um, but you said that your father was encouraging you to be a professional woman, is that right? And not how to be wife. Um, I think that's a pretty good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but um, but actually, you are right that that the culture um, uh, involved with the traditions is very important in shaping the way we behave. But at the same time, I think that history is also very important. That is, the changes in the world that happen that allow uh, allow different kinds of communication. For instance. Uh, the, the very technology that we have now, where we can learn so much from others to choose what works and what does not. I think that is going to help us. And that's what the Iranian uh, the revolutionaries are actually emphasizing a lot. And what we're doing outside, I think one of the things that was asked before, I think you asked, Marisa, mm -hmm. uh, is how to keep this going, is to make sure, uh, one of the things that would be very important to make sure is to make sure that communication and connection, technology connection, remains intact mm -hmm. and can happen because that will keep the ideas out there. But culture change is, is, is very important and historical change, that is changing of the circumstances, helps culture change uh, to, to come about. And, and uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, your question also, you know, is, is related uh, somewhat to the same. That is, change in, in the Middle East, you know, with all the problems that we have, with all the wars and destruction that is going on and right now with the earthquake added to that. Uh, all of that is, is, is there, uh, but uh, what we also have is the, the, the way people have changed their outlook, you know, and then the education. So many of the countries have more women more highly educated than the men. They're, mm -hmm. they're the a majority of the uh, university uh, graduates. They're the majority of the specialists. That will leave an impact. It's just that how fast it will happen depends on how much support globally we have. You know, and and if if that uh, if we can, you know. Uh, make sure that we consider it our issue, you know, and not someone else that is coming to fix it. I think that that, uh, that will be uh, possible and, and uh, probable. Manas, thank you so much for your time uh, this morning. But before closing, I uh, want to give the floor to Hale to say a few words. Um. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you for the, our viewer. I don't know, you said 170, 200. 270. <laughs> 270 who are watching the program on uh, Zoom. Uh, Marisa, thanks for organizing it. This is the third uh, forum that you have organized for the center for me. Thanks, and thank you, Alex, and thank you, Brooke. And also thanks to all my other colleagues around the center. Um, Mahno, special thanks to you. I, we go back, I think, five decades now. <laughs> yeah, uh, almost, or over five decades. And I was witness to all your activities in the women's organization of Iran. For me, the biggest achievement you did was the family protection. Mm. That was an amazing effort of you and your team. And I think the courage you showed, I mean, to pass that law. So I always thought if we were living in another country, that law would be called the Mahnaz Afghani Family Thank Protection you. Law. Thank you. And we really, you deserve that. I mean, if women can seek a divorce today in Iran, partially today, it's thanks to you. If child custody was given to the parents, it was thanks to you. 
if the age of marriage for women was raised to 18 from 13, back now to 13, it's thanks to you. So you mm -hmm. deserve, you really, I think the women of Iran owe a lot of gratitude I to do. you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. This is for my <laughs> Thank you very much uh, uh, to all of you, and uh, please join us for uh, cookies and coffee um, okay. and a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>